Hi everybody and welcome to another video of Meta Youth Leadership. This video is looking at the important subject of natural versus spiritual leadership. There are some people that are natural leaders, there are people that have been taught leadership skills and, and that's great, but there is a difference, there is a distinctive between natural leadership and spiritual leadership. They're linked but there is a difference and I want to explore that difference today and I also want to touch on the issue of suffering and leadership. So before we dive in, let's say a short prayer to ask God to speak to us through this content that we're about to look at together. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we commit this meta video to you and we just say, Lord, please speak to us by your spirit and help us to be leaders like Jesus who can really make a difference in this world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to dive straight in. I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, we're looking today at natural and spiritual leadership. Let's dive straight in. Let's define leadership to start with. What is leadership? Well, leadership is best defined by influence, being able to influence others to follow you. Um, the Oxford English Dictionary defines leadership as the action of leading a group of people or an organisation. That's good, but it doesn't quite fill out what leadership is at its essence. I like this definition by Lord Montgomery. He was a British general during World War II, really significant guy. And he said this, he said, leadership is the capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character which inspires confidence. I like that. I think he's getting he's getting to something there. Now, this kind of leadership would be seen as natural leadership. And even natural leadership is God given. God gives this through our natural wiring, our personalities and our abilities. Natural leadership even comes from God, too. Of course, it can be used for good or for ill. And at this stage, as we begin, I want to briefly share with you the law of the lid. The law of the lid is an important law when it comes to leadership, because what it says is you can only lead others as far as you yourself have gone. So if you're going to increase your leadership ability, you can bring others to that level as well. And that's what Meta is all about. We want you to grow as leaders in the world, as strong disciples of Jesus Christ, that you are more and more skilled to lead others. And leadership is all about trust. This is what leadership is about. If people trust you, they'll follow you. And of course, we're not asking people to follow us in some selfish way. The leadership we're looking at is to enable others to follow us for good purposes. And so we have to build trust. And so one of the tools we're going to look at now is the influence model. And the influence model says in order to influence somebody, in order to lead others, you have to build trust. And trust, in order to get a transaction or to do something together, in order to build trust, there are particularly, there are four key elements. Now, there are probably lots of elements, but these are really important. There's character, chemistry, competency, and credibility. And I want us to look at each of those in turn, because if you've got all four of those, you are going to build incredible trust with other people. And usually we're good at one of these, sometimes two of these but not usually good at all four at the same time. And the best leaders in the world in terms of natural ability are good at all four. Let's look at them in turn. So trust builders, what are people really asking if they're going to follow you, if you're going to have influence in their life? Firstly, character. People want to people want to know, do I really trust this person? Is this person a person of integrity? Are you for me or are you really just for yourself? And you're asking me to do something just for your own purposes character is massive as we know chemistry is number two chemistry is all about do i like you do i connect with you do i enjoy spending time with you and it's interesting that chemistry is really important people will follow people where they feel they've got a bit of chemistry it really helps when it comes to influence so there's character and there's chemistry but there's also competency if people if you're going to have influence in people's lives they're asking are you competent in other words do you really know what you're talking about? Can you do this well? What you're asking me to go and do, are you good at it? Is this is this something that you know about? Are you confident in the way you communicate your competence? And sometimes they're asking, do you have a proven track record? Not everyone has that to begin with. And credibility is really, can you apply your competency into my world in a credible way? 
In other words, is it relevant to me? Now, here's the question. Which of these four C's do you need to work on the most at the moment? I want you to think about it. It's going to be one of the homeworks for this week. Which of these C's do you need to work on the most? And voices plays a part. So if we go back to this picture for a minute, it's interesting that pioneers, pioneer create, sorry, pioneers, creative pioneers and guardians are naturally focused around competence and credibility. They naturally find their, their sort of find this easier and they're better at it. And they have to work much harder at character and chemistry. Whereas nurturers, creative connectors and connectors naturally tend to focus around character and chemistry and they have to work much harder at competence and credibility. So knowing your voice will help you to see perhaps where some of the challenges are and where you need to put a bit more work. But I want you to think about think about that as part of the homework. What we're going to do now, though, is we're going to look at Jesus's view of leadership because there's one thing getting good at natural leadership. But Meta is also about taking you to a whole nother level in terms of spiritual leadership. So let's see how Jesus led. And we're going to look up Mark chapter 10 verses 35 to 45. So if you can get a Bible right now, we're going to look up Mark chapter 10, 35 to 45. I'm going to read that to us right now. Let's go for it. Then James and John, who were disciples of Jesus, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Well, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised? or be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. And what he means there is the suffering that he's about to go through. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten, the ten other disciples, heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. They're upset. They called them together and said, sorry, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles, Gentiles and non-Jews, lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's get into what Jesus is talking about here. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we're going to dive in on Jesus's understanding of leadership. And Jesus's view of leadership is what we call spiritual leadership or Christian leadership, because Jesus said this instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all really interesting so in that passage James and John two of the disciples are asking for a lot they're asking that when Jesus comes again in his glory we know Jesus is going to come and and there'll be the consummation he'll bring the he'll draw history um to a close and he will be the Lord of Lords and King of Kings everyone will see him James and John are saying can we sit at your left and right when you come and do that what a request and really what they're asking for is status and prestige this was what they felt was about glory about being great about the top leadership and jesus uses this opportunity to say guys you've got leadership all wrong greatness is not about prestige and status it's about whether you are willing to serve with love in the most humble of ways it's what jesus calls servant leadership and I love this picture here because you've got this leader here who's holding a rope so that others can hit their target. It's about helping others achieve well. It's about serving others. It's about serving God. And um, that's what servant leadership is about. And that's what Jesus came to do. It says for even the son of man, that's Jesus's favorite name for himself. That's Jesus, son of man. For even Jesus, the son of man, did not come to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what is greatness in God's eyes. That's what great leadership looks like. And for that reason, this kind of leadership, spiritual leadership, Christian leadership, 
leadership of Jesus will involve suffering. It's not something we can escape from. We don't go after it like a like a masochist or oh, must be suffering to be doing well. No, um, we don't want to do that at all. But suffering is part of the course. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Let's look briefly at what the difference is then between natural versus spiritual leadership. Natural leadership can be very good and we want to enhance that. But we really want to grow the spiritual leadership. So what's distinctive about it? Well, I want to share with you these two columns, and we're going to look at these in turn very briefly. And just before we dive into this table of natural leadership on the left and spiritual leadership on the right, I want to say this, that even with natural leadership skills, these will reach their highest effectiveness when they are employed in the service of God and for his glory. In other words, when you take those natural leadership gifts that God's given you and you decide to use them for God and his kingdom, for his glory, for good purposes, he will enhance them and take them to a new level. And the difference really here between natural and spiritual leadership is that this is leadership empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't in this column, but the Holy Spirit is in this column. And let's look at the difference. So in natural leadership, you get leaders that are self-confident. That's not a bad thing. But in spiritual leadership, you get those that are confident in God, that God's got my back. God's going to do this. God's my strength. God's going to give me what I need to achieve it. There's a whole different level of power available. In natural leadership, we know people. But in spiritual leadership, yes, we still know people, but we also know God. What a wonderful thing to be able to know people and God when it comes to leading others. Making own decisions in natural leadership. It's all about making the right decisions, own decisions. But in spiritual leadership, we're seeking to find out what's God's will in this. What does God want us to do? How does God want me to make this decision? In natural leadership, it's about ambition, uh, achieving certain things for our own ends. But in spiritual leadership, it's more self-effacing to give God the glory. That means it's, it's not about my name being great. It's about God being great through the work that I do. In natural leadership, we'll find ways to use our own methods to achieve things. But in spiritual leadership, we're looking for God's methods revealed in the Bible. And we've just looked at one. Servant leadership is a really key method that God teaches us to use. In natural leadership, we're motivated by personal goals. It might be to achieve a certain salary figure. It might be a certain position in a company. Um, it might be a house somewhere or whatever it might be. But in spiritual leadership, it's motivated by love for God and people. It's I want to do this for God and I want to do this for others. It's not to say that there aren't really good natural leadership goals for people that can be very kind. But particularly in spiritual leadership, we're motivated by love for God and people. We're not honour God in what we're doing. Natural leadership is much more independent, whereas spiritual leadership, leadership is God dependent. We're depending on God. We're looking to God at every stage. Natural leadership obviously relies on natural gifts. Whereas spiritual leadership takes those natural gifts, as we said over here, but is actually taking them full of the spirit, asking for the wisdom from God. Wisdom is knowing the right thing to do based on the knowledge in any and every situation and faith and um, seeking God in faith and grace, which is love. And there's a lovely uh, passage if you get a chance to look at it in Acts 6, where the, the apostles, the 12 disciples have got too much on and they need to appoint other leaders and they're looking for certain qualities in other leaders to do quite menial jobs. And these are the four qualities they see they're looking for. Full of the spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith, full of grace. And lastly, in natural leadership, you want to avoid suffering as much as you can. But in spiritual leadership, we have to learn to embrace personal suffering as part of the call to that leadership. I want you to hear from a great friend of mine, James, now. And I'm going to hand over to James, who... Um, who's a Christian leader in business, uh, in the education sector. I've worked with James for years. We've had great times together, James and I, over the years, partnering for the gospel together in different parts, in some challenging places in London. He's doing an amazing job. He's got a great business. He's got people working for him. He works in schools. Over to James to share uh, on a few questions I've given him around the distinctive of Christian leadership. How does he lead as a Christian? Thank you very much, Stu. It's a pleasure to be addressing you guys. I've heard amazing things about you all. And um, yeah, it's just an honour to just share my perspective on being a Christian leader in business. So I'm just going to walk through these questions that have been sent through and yeah, we'll go from there. So question number one is, 
how and in what ways does being a follower of Jesus impact how you lead your business? This is a fantastic question. It's a very vast one. And there's a variety of ways in which being a follower of Jesus um, informs how I lead my business. But I think a, a key passage that comes to mind is in the, um, the Gospel of Matthew, where it says, Go forth, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so this is a, a key passage that comes to mind when I think about running a business. Um, there's another passage in Ephesians that speaks about how, you know, God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. And I see my business as an expression of that. I see running my business effectively and honestly um, in a way whereby it's an opportunity to, to give God glory um, in terms of how I run my business. Being a follower of Jesus, it means that I'm continually to, to be um, intentional about running it in a way that honours God. I think in the business world, there's definitely going to be trappings and temptations to do things in a way that might not honour God. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about that. And I'm not saying I'm absolutely perfect, but I, I do know that being a Christian, it means that there's, a, there's an additional lens of consideration and conduct that I am to um, be really thoughtful about as I think about my business practice, as I think about my conduct as a, as a leader. So that's one key thing. Really, really um, impacted by um, a, a Christian theologian who, who wrote a book on, on work, basically. And in this book, he speaks, his name's Timothy Keller, and he speaks about, um, as Christians, um, essentially, in Colossians, it speaks about whatever your hands find to do, do it wholeheartedly as if onto the Lord. And so that's definitely something that informs my, my business practice, the sense of actually, if I'm going to do this, I want to I want to give it my all. What's really interesting about that particular passage is the word for wholeheartedly is, funnily enough, it's the same word for your soul, basically. Um, so it's almost like put your everything into it. So there's a sense in which being a Christian, it means that actually if God has entrusted me to run a business, I'm going to absolutely go for it, but I want to go for it in a way that brings him glory. We know that as a Christian leader, there will be moments of suffering because you are a Christian. Can you share an example of that? And how did that impact your faith and leadership? Suffering can come in different ways, but if we're looking at it through the lens of business, I think from a social sort of perspective, I think the closest thing I've experienced is when I was working with a marketing company. I still work with them now, actually. And what's really, really interesting is that, um, yeah, they had some marketing practices that were not fully legitimate. <laughs> Put it that way. Many companies might use some of these practices. And when they started working with me, they thought that they can use these practices with my company as well. And when I found out about those practices, I told them quite plainly that, um, yeah, I'm Christian. They knew actually prior to that when we were getting to the media, but I told them, hold on my face. I'm not willing to do this, this, this and that. So I'm happy to work with you, but in order for us to continue working together, we need to do things differently. And it was interesting because I could tell it deeply frustrated them, particularly as we had sort of business partnership that the better my business did, <laughs> the better they did as well. They, they, they were getting a cut. And it deeply frustrated them. We put up some really interesting conversations where I was able to talk about my faith later on and how I met Jesus. And I found out that one of the, the um, founders actually is his, his, his grandson of quite a well-known um, mission organisation as well. So I think that's the closest thing to suffering. It's just that social awkwardness when you hold the line for, for, for the sake of your faith. I think six, 20 minutes ago, that's the closest thing I can relate to suffering. But if, again, if I was to be super honest with you, I think that's nothing in compared to what our brothers and sisters are going through in other places in the world. So that's my spill. Hopefully that's given you some food for thought. And um, yeah, pray that you continue to have a fantastic time. God bless you. God bless you. God bless.